Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Catherine Atmansky, and I'm just delighted to just say a few words of welcome here. My role at Royal Roads University is to serve as the director of the School of Leadership Studies. And to start us off in a good way, I'll just ask my friend Selena to change to the next slide. Thank you. We would like to acknowledge that Royal Roads University uh, is located on the traditional lands of the Kosapsum and the Lekwungen families and ancestors. And um, the, the, the Lekwungen and Kosapsum families have stewarded the land in such a beautiful way that we are so very deeply grateful to have the opportunity to live and work and learn together on these lands. And of course, we acknowledge that in a virtual setting like this, we're joining from perhaps all around the world. Uh, we'd be joining from many, many different lands. And for those who didn't hear me say this earlier, if you would like to acknowledge the lands from which you are joining today, please feel free to do so by using the chat. And I can see many people doing that already. Thank you very much. It just gives us a sense of where people are joining from today. Uh, so with that, I'll ask Selena, please, to go to the next slide and mention that this particular webinar is hosted by the Masters of Arts in Global Leadership. We have a whole suite of global leadership programs in the School of Leadership Studies, uh, for which Wanda and Guy can tell you a little bit more uh, later, uh, later in today's session. But for now, we'll just mention that these are our hosts. So thank you very much to the Masters of Arts in Global Leadership. And with that, I think I will introduce the program head of the Masters of Art of Global Leadership, Dr. Wanda Krauss, and our dear friend and colleague, Dr. Guy Naismith, both of whom will be speaking about why planetary health matters in this global le leadership series. This is the first of a new series on global leadership. So Guy and Wanda, over to you. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, so um, this is the first of a series of webinars that we're bringing to you on a number of key topics or rather key challenges that affect global leaders and global leaders um, will need to be stepping up to. And so we're beginning with a broader topic of planetary health, recognizing that this might be uh, a new term for, for many, and our objective is to explain what that is and what that entails. Um, so the question and title of today's webinar, Why Planetary Health? Uh, both Guy Naismith and I, uh, I'm Wanda Krause, Program Head of Global Leadership, would like to explore that rather, rather than necessarily defining it for you to help us all collectively understand how we can play a role from a systems perspective. So I will now hand it over to Guy to begin our webinar uh, and look forward to interacting with you all towards the end of this webinar as well. Next slide, please. All right. Um... Thanks for that, uh, Wanda. You know, I almost forgot to turn my mic on and I'm pretty sure that uh, when this whole pandemic thing is over, I'm gonna be in a boardroom somewhere and I'm gonna say to people, can everybody hear me? Can everybody see me? Um, good morning, everyone. And to those of you uh, who are in different time zones, good afternoon, uh, good evening. It's really nice to see a few, um, a few familiar names in the, uh, uh, in the list of uh, folks that I can see, and I can't see everyone, but uh, great to see folks here. Uh, I have to say, and, and I'm looking at, uh, at Wanda right now, I have to say that I have been so busy lately that I've been pulled in so many different directions and kind of feel like I'm just fighting and putting out fires. And Wanda talked about uh, key challenges. That's one of them. That's one of them is, is us getting into this position of moving too fast. So before I even start, I have to say I'm a little bit of a hypocrite uh, and I'm working on it and I think we're all a work in progress. Um, before I get started, I would like to say um, I am coming to you from the lands of the Wasanich people. Uh, and whenever I say that, I always look out my window. This morning, as I was getting ready for the webinar, I found myself looking out my window and wondering about planetary health. And I'm looking and I'm seeing 
a beautiful Gary Oak tree, probably about 200 years old, uh, native to this area. So wonderful uh, Gary Oak Meadows are unique to this area uh, that the Wasanich people lived in. I'm also seeing a cherry tree planted, uh, a couple of deodar cedars planted, uh, a couple of pine trees planted, uh, two uh, cedar hedges planted. We have made such a difference to this planet um, without even really thinking about it. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, land acknowledgement, I get to start now. All right, uh, over to the next slide. What I wanna do is I want to talk about global leadership, planetary health and systems thinking, or to, I guess to be more precise, global leadership and planetary health through the lens of systems thinking concepts, which I really wanna get into. Um, and here's the challenge. The challenge is uh, talking about leadership in any form um, as if everybody knew what it was because we don't. So there is something um, called uh, implicit theories of leadership. I believe this was, uh, this theory was started by uh, Robert Lord and colleagues a number of years ago, uh, that we all have these implicit theories of leadership in our minds. And so we know what leadership is, even if we haven't spoken it out loud, even if we haven't articulated it to ourselves, we know what leadership is. It comes from places like mm, Hollywood movies, what do they say leadership is? Um, our parents, the way they, they behave, what does that mean to leadership? Uh, other people's parents, other influences in our lives, what does that mean to, to leadership? <clears throat> All of these different influences. Uh, some people talk about the triple bottom line, uh, and I believe it goes like this, uh, profit, people, planet. Why is profit first? I don't know, that's just made up. And why isn't there a fourth one, self? Uh, why don't we focus on sustaining ourselves as well as sustaining people, planet, and you know, I suppose money comes in there somewhere. Um, so all of our implicit theories of leadership are different. Um, and here's the challenge. We have to move beyond our implicit theories of leadership. We have to open up our thinking to new ways of understanding leadership. And that's what Wanda and I are going to be talking about today. Global leadership includes planetary health. Um, and changing our minds is not easy. Changing our ways of thinking is not easy. And in fact, when Wanda and I were preparing for this, we were talking about, we all know what basically what to do in order to, to focus on and, and address planetary health, but we're not doing it. Why? Because it's really, it's a real challenge uh, to think differently about, um, about leadership and about our ways of understanding leadership. So, next slide. Here we go. Here's another thing Wanda and I were talking about. Somehow it worked out that I'm going to be sharing the bad news and Wanda is going to be sharing the good news. Uh, but uh, we'll start out with the bad news. Uh, and I want to have a little look at history and some of our tendencies as humans. No, I have to be more clear than that. Some of our tendencies as civilized humans, and I'm putting civilized in air quotes, uh, <clears throat> humans. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, Ronald Wright, uh, a great Canadian author and lecturer, uh, wrote a book called A Short History of Progress. It's not my goal here to repeat what he said in that book, although um, <laughs> uh, it's a worthwhile book. I mean, if you want to understand global leadership, uh, read A Short History of Progress as a cautionary tale. Uh, for how we might shift how we approach global leadership. Uh, this was a Massey lecture book in 2004, uh, and so Ronald Wright was going around the country um, with a series of lectures, uh, really highlighting some very, very critical points about who we are and how we behave as civilized humans. So I want to go back to the beginning, and I'm going to try not to take any more than my... Uh, my 20 minutes wand, I want to go back to the beginning to the Neolithic Revolution. Uh, there's another author here that you might be interested in. His name is Chris Ryan, uh, and he's, uh, he's written a great deal about the impact that the Neolithic Revolution had on our society. For example, before the Neolithic Revolution, and we know this by both 
ethical and some less ethical studies of uh, foraging people and uh, indigenous people, uh, we know that before the Neolithic revolution, one of the things that defined human society was what Chris Ryan calls fierce egalitarianism. So there was no room to say, oh, well, to say it right out loud, to say that men were more important or better than women. Uh, but after the Neolithic Revolution, the only way to have bigger and bigger farms, more and more power, uh, was to have more people. The only way to make more people, well, you know, all know that. So what happens? Women become property. So that happened as a result of the Neolithic Revolution. Um, agriculture made cities possible. So to be clear, and this is getting back to Ronald right now, if you find a lovely river with arable land all around this river and you build a village uh, near the river and you farm the land, that's a good idea. That just makes sense. But if that village grows and grows and grows, uh, and we start to pave over the arable land around the river, it's no longer a good idea. So we see these trends that seem to be part of human civilization. Uh, so the, the civilization seems to have certain tendencies. Uh, and what happened is ancient civilizations expanded relatively quickly uh, in terms of population. So what did this cause? Well, this caused people to pave over, both figuratively and literally, pave over the arid, ar arable land. Uh, so then we rely on innovation uh, in order to survive. So we have, we see this explosion of innovation, um, increasing um, levels of, um, of productivity from, from fields and so on, uh, where, where we, are, we require the food in order to feed the cities. Um, so what this is, now I'm gonna have a look at this through a, a systems thinking lens. Uh, what this is, I'm almost halfway through my time. What this is, is um, a reinforcing feedback loop. That's a systems thinking concept. So a reinforcing feedback loop um, is, uh, is characterizes systems where events build on themselves. Many people have used the example of a snowball rolling down a hill. It starts at the top, it's small, it roll, it's rolling fairly slowly, not gathering up very much snow as it rolls, but as it rolls, uh, it gathers more snow, starts moving faster, gathers more snow quicker, and we see this reinforcing feedback loop of the, the, uh, the snowball rolling down the hill. It works in all kinds of different systems. If you have a certain amount of money in the bank, it earns interest. That makes it more money. That means it earns more interest faster. That makes it more money. It earns more interest faster and so on. And you see a reinforcing feedback loop works the other way as well. Uh, a stock starts go tumbling, going down, then, then it's worth less money. And because it's worth less money, then it tumbles down further and it's worth less money. Still a reinforcing feedback loop. Um, in ancient civilizations, these reinforcing feedback loops, what they did was they tended to use up the earth and the water, even the air <clears throat> because of deforestation. So they tended up to use up the earth and the water. The very things that made life possible get used up. Do you think that's still going on today? Of course it is. <clears throat> it's still going. Consider this, just, just as a, something to think about. Uh, when the Roman um, Empire was at its height, uh, the population of the earth was about 200 million people. It took 13 centuries to double that. 13 centuries uh, to add another 200 million people to the overall population of the earth. Today, the population of the Earth is just teetering on the edge of 8 billion. And to add 200 million people, not make 200 million new people, but to add 200 million people to the overall population takes less than three years. 13 centuries to three years. That's a reinforcing feedback loop. Um, there's another kind of, or another perspective on reinforcing feedback loops that I wanna share because I think that's uh, critical at this point. Um, reinforce, uh, 
civilization uh, tends to have a reinforcing feedback loop leading towards a huge population. There's two reasons for this, and both of these reasons are challenges that we have to face up to. Uh, one of them is biological. Uh, the population will expand uh, consistent with the food supply. So the more food there is, the more people there will be, reinforcing feedback loop. The second one is societal. Uh, and so if we go back, and again, through a systems thinking lens, if we go back to the 50s and we look at uh, Talcott Parsons' um, notion that systems, and if in particular human systems, will progress towards increasing levels of complexity, then what we see is um, increasing levels and increasing increasingly complex levels of hierarchy. Now, um, I'm going to go off on a tangent just for a second because, and this is back to Chris Ryan's work. Uh, many people say, well, that, that's just the way we are. That is our nature. We are humans. Look at our closest relatives in nature. Those are chimpanzees. And chimpanzees have not only complex hierarchical societies, their societies are also defined by violence. So people say, well, that's just, that's just the way we are. Crap, that's not the way we are. First of all, we get to make choices. Second, that whole concept is, is flawed because chimpanzees are not our closest relatives in nature. Our closest relatives in nature are bonobos, uh, and bonobos societies are not in any way defined by violence. They are almost entirely violence-free. Uh, there's a lot of sex, uh, but there's virtually no violence and their, um, their hierarchical structures are much softer, much simpler. There is no reason we have to have these complex environment or hierarchical structures uh, that are limiting our ability to live um, a compassionate life. Um, so, but here's what, <laughs> sorry, Wanda, I'm going fast now. So here's what uh, the hierarchies do. Uh, the hierarchies mean that the people at the top of the hierarchies, the ones that are most invested in the hierarchies, first of all, will try to maintain the hierarchies because they are the ones with power. They also get all the food. So there's never gonna be enough to go around. Have a look at the world right now. What do you see? Exactly that hierarchies of people where the people with privilege, the people at the top have the food and the others, not so much. Um, so what does that lead to? Mm, more innovation. So now we're, we're using every in last innovation we can find to farm, to get food to everyone, if possible, not working, but at least we're trying. Um, and what does that do? It leads to using up the earth, the water and the air more reinforcing feedback loops. Um, all right, so what I want to do now is, um, oh, actually, no, I have one more. I have a couple of notes here, which I don't normally do. Um, so a couple of uh, things from Ronald Wright. Um, each time history re repeats itself, the price goes up. But here's the thing, and here's, here's the way out. Doing all right. Um, Reinforcing feedback loops in systems theory are, by definition, incomplete. That snowball that's rolling down the hill will eventually get to the bottom of the hill. Uh, it, it has to stop. There has to be a balance somewhere. That is the nature of systems. It's a law. For example, uh, our, uh, our economy is based on growth. <laughs> it's not going to keep on going. You can't keep growing forever. Uh, so there will always be balancing loops. Here's one. Uh, and just to keep in mind, balancing loops are going to happen to us or we're going to make them happen. Here's one. Um, when Christopher Columbus discovered, this is back to Ronald right now, when Christopher Columbus, who, by the way, was a great, great explorer and was not the person who discovered North America, uh, there was already lots of people here who knew that North America was here. When Christopher Columbus landed in the West Indies or East Indies? When Christopher Columbus landed in the something Indies um, in 1492, the population of the three Americas, really hard to guess, and so there's a bit of a debate about this, but best guess. The population of the three Americas, North America, Central America, and South America, was about uh, 100 million people. In come the Europeans, bringing with them 
yes, war, but not necessarily war. It wasn't. It wasn't the wars that and the and different attitudes uh, that killed the indigenous people. It was germs, smallpox, influenza, and so on, um, killed up to eighty percent of the indigenous population of the, of those three Americas. Eighty percent of a hundred million people. <clears throat> that is a balancing loop. The Earth's, Earth's population was expanding, and then it balances, and it gets smaller, and then it expands again. That was a balancing loop. Uh, so we see these monumental reinforcing feedback loops in the world today are going to balance. Uh, change is going to happen. It's coming. And it's going to come in the form of war or famine uh, or climate change or disease, whatever. It's coming. Or or we could decide how to create balancing loop and we could decide mindfully because that's, that's the way out of this. That's the way out of these reinforcing loops that we barely see because we're so used to them. A couple more points and then oh, back to Wanda. There's two things about systems thinking that I wanna highlight. One of them is um, it allows us to see these big, these, these big patterns. It allows us to see these things that are happening to our world that we're doing to our world. And also it allows us to see more specifically that we need to introduce balancing loops into these reinforcing loops before the balance happens to us in really bad ways. Um, we need to stop responding to complexity with velocity. I so wish I could tell you who said that. These are not my words and I have searched and searched and I can't find them. Not my words, but that is what we're doing. We're responding to complexity with velocity. We just keep on working harder and harder and harder uh, against these reinforcing loops without finding ways of actually really balancing them. So um, let's go back to the top of the hierarchy. Those are the leaders in the world. Those are the people with privilege, the top of the hierarchy, the people who want to sustain that hierarchy, to sustain these reinforcing loops because they are the ones that are benefiting. Those are the leaders. Those are the ones who have to change their minds. Who are they? Us. They are us. We are the people that are focusing on global leadership. We are the ones that have to change our mindsets. We are the ones that have to perpetuate a new way of thinking. We need to be willing and mindfully let go of what we have known in the past. We need to stop responding to complexity with velocity. Um, and we need to have the courage to change the way we think, to change the way we behave. Uh, Otto Scharmer writes extensively about this. You know, it's one thing to understand. It's another thing to feel something deeply, and it is yet another thing to actually change the way we behave in order to bring about change. Why? Because we're afraid. We're afraid of doing things differently. Finally, uh, I am, oh, look at that. I'm right on my 20 minutes. Uh, finally, let's go back to the very beginning, our implicit theories of leadership. We have to suspend them in front of us like mental models uh, and say, is that real? Is it complete? Is there another way I could look at leadership and global leadership in order to address these, these gigantic, robust challenges that are facing us? And if there is, how do I do that? Okay, uh, I'm gonna stop there uh, and I'm gonna hand it over to Wanda because she has this wonderful perspective on how we might shift our way of thinking. So Wanda, back to you and next slide. Thank you, Guy. Um, shall we skip this slide as well? Yeah, because we were supposed to be on that one earlier. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here we go. Thank you, Guy. Um, you know, as you were speaking, I was, I have some assistance thinking books in front of me and thinking, okay, where's Guy going with, with um, bringing some of these principles together? Because there are dozens of systems thinking principles. And I just love the way you've pulled uh, some together to provide this overall picture for us to discuss global leadership and how we can move forward. And I, I do have 
a framework that I will propose. It's not mine. It's um, it's created by a number of thinkers, and I'm just synthesizing some of their thinking around how to move forward. Um, the first person that I'll I'll bring into the discussion is Michel Onfray. He's a French philosopher and has written now several books, most of them not translated into English. And one of his books called Cosmos, which was written in 2016, discusses what he refers to as dead time versus a live time. And so how to move this feedback loop that Guy has said and mentioned um, is just a natural phenomena and many of which are in directions that we would love to avoid. For example, we have uh, COVID times that we're going through right now, which if we knew ahead of time could be avoided, of course we would. But as Guy has mentioned, these loops and these cycles will continue no matter what. And so the approach is really to have a holistic understanding to begin with, and then holistic practices so that we can at least intentionally start to create change, knowing that there are overwhelming feedback loops and directions happening and that we are part of that system. So being part of that system, we can we can create change. We can try to influence change. So dead time, according to Michelle Onfray, uh, is a description of our times. He thinks a little bit more in terms of virtual reality, but also acknowledges other thinkers' interpretation of what dead time means, being the political times, um, such as war, where things are in chaos, um, virtual time, which he refers to also in terms of chaos, creating a situation that is, you know, as Guy has mentioned, a snowball going down a hill where time is going, going so quickly that we can't, and as you also mentioned, Guy, at the beginning, um, admittedly, I, I, it applies to me, I think it applies to many people, where where you know we we might think or refer to the rat race we might refer to being pulled into different directions and not quite knowing what to do there are ways we can go beyond managing and so what on free talks about is it's not about managing in fact managing it, and he uses the words um you know that are a little bit you know, I'll just say it, he, re he refers to suicide. It's suicide to manage this snowball going down a hill. Rather, he suggests we need to imbue our times, our dead time, with a live time. And what that means for him is in the storm we're in, there is what's also called, obviously, the eye of the storm. And so that's where we need to sit. That's where we need to settle and breathe. And within that space, expand that space. Even if we go along with the systems principle of, um, and Guy could probably explain that better than I can, of 2080, where the outputs in the system are created by 20%. And so if we can think along those lines, it, it, perhaps we can see that we have a little bit more power than it seems to create and expand that space and to create outputs that are in favor of creating a live time um, and our own well-being. So a live time for Onfray means very simple things, very simple beingness and practices to larger, larger macro level um, attention to the system. So understanding, first of all, that we are part of the system, a self in the system, and that our own states influence the system, whether we can see the connection or not. And so focusing on the self and the simple practices, for example, of mindfulness. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Thinking about behaviors, what are we doing in this chaos? Are we more aware of what we're doing and the impacts of what we're doing onto others and the larger system. So it's not just about others in terms of the human others. 
Because with that feedback loop, whatever we're impacting in the system that we think is not alive, it actually is alive and will impact us. We'll talk a little bit about that when we go into planetary health. And then to think of also how we can collectively move from I to we to create this change and within the larger, broader systems influence that change, whether that's socioeconomic or political. Next slide, please. So here comes the concept of planetary health. And moving from I to we means not just we in terms of humans and being aware of the impact we have on the system is not, a ju not just about the human system, it's the planetary system. So planetary health is, it's a new field and it was um, brought to discussion more around 2015 although it's been discussed since the 1970s. And so it's essentially um, a competing vocabulary, we can call it, where uh, we're thinking about ideas together. Uh, it's, it's, it's new, so there's many ways we can define it and think about it, and also solutions. So as Guy mentioned, there's the bad news, um, but we need to know what the bad news is so that we can think about how to move forward. So thinking a little bit in terms of what that good could look like. And it's a framework that allows for multiple sectors and during our, our very turbulent times, you know, as I, Einstein had said, we have to come in with new thinking to address the challenges, the complex challenges of our times. We can't look back to what other leaders have done in the past. We really do have to think across sectors and across disciplines to address the challenges, these key um, wicked problems of our times. And so the stewardship that's now required of us is not just about thinking in terms of individualistic public health or personal health, and not even more thinking along the lines of global health and what that essentially refers to is an understanding that different populations are impacted differently depending on context, place, um, socioeconomic or even political status, that we actually have to go beyond that. And so here we have the terminology One Health, which was to address this, um, this kind of thinking that still separates us from our outer world and awareness of how we impact others and vice versa, where we're thinking with One Health more around um, human and animal systems. So what we think are alive, Planetary health incorporates that, that larger system of our planet, um, and it can actually go beyond, but thinking of our, our planet at this time, it goes beyond what we think are living systems, because living systems incorporates way more than animal life or human life. It incorporates the planet's health overall. And with that broader macro level understanding, from that view, we can perhaps better understand that when we destroy the planet, and obviously, um, even though we see, um, you know, we're living longer, our, our health in general is better, that what we've done to the earth at the same time, in order to extract whatever we think we need to live a better life has actually created a worsening situation. And so from that broader view to understand how to take care of the planet, to take care of ourselves and vice versa. And it really shouldn't be just about ourselves, but that might be the starting point to start thinking about planetary health. Next slide, please. So planetary health to offer a brief definition is um, here, we have it on the slide, the health of our planet as absolutely linked to our own health. And we have to think, um, you know, not just in terms of health of the planet, but health of civilization. So when we think about civil society and Guy talked a little bit about that trajectory and, you know, what we call progress, 
it's creating civil society to be oriented towards what we call as a value system civilized or a civilization that has that larger broader broader macro level consciousness of all its parts being interrelated so um, the flourishing of natural systems is interrelated with human health and so therefore we need to start thinking a little bit differently actually a lot differently about what stewardship means it's not just taking care of ourselves individualistically or groups it's thinking about our natural resources and taking care of our natural resources at the same time so planetary health is actually an approach to life um, and within that approach we're thinking about civil society think about civilization and what we're doing to others and the planet that creates inequalities and with the objective that all people on the globe have the right to enjoy health and well-being and in that process we cannot leave no one we cannot leave anyone behind so um before we move forward and think a little bit more about how we can do better it's important i think to understand that we are all catalysts of change we are all part of that 20 percent and so we need ourselves to be thinking of becoming uh greater catalysts of change and bringing our best selves to these biggest wicked challenges next slide please So in terms of planetary health practice, if we can break it down into four different approaches, here I'm bringing an approach uh, that's described by integral theory to incorporate four different perspectives. So one, uh, that's the upper left quadrant, we may call it, is thinking about our being. How are we being within the eye of the storm? what are our states of being and this is really important because if we're not thinking about our states and our being and we're just running where are we running to what are our impacts in that process of running to wherever we're, we think we're running to so slowing down and thinking also about the discourses what we're you know how we can bring our different disciplines together Number two, what are we doing? So what are our behaviors? What are our actions? Are they aligned to our values? Are they aligned to what we believe should be our states of being? And it doesn't necessarily mean that we go out um, and become activists in certain ways where we're confronting the um the dark parts of the system but perhaps it's being more innovative more creative perhaps it's being generative to refer to Otto Scharmer's approach to how we may collectively move forward during our times and number three again these are all different or four key perspectives to addressing planetary health practice what are our values? Are we aligning our behaviors and actions to our values? And with number three, it's thinking collectively. It's not individualistic anymore. What can be our values collectively within civilization where we need to make greater shifts, maybe incremental shifts or larger shifts to address our current challenges? And how can we work together? And number four, putting it all together so self and systems and here we have a you know just a picture of um depicting agriculture or farming thinking of everything in terms of systems so all the components in hierarchy what are those nested systems within the larger broader macro systems so here for example food systems how are we impacting those and how are those drivers within our smaller systems so thinking about all four in approaching planetary health practice 
And next slide, please. We've got uh, 10 minutes for you to get together in small breakout rooms. For those of you who do not want to move out into a breakout room, you can just stay in the main room and take a little bit of a break. But I would like to invite you to think together, um, keeping in mind these four different ways or perspectives of creating change or influencing change for greater planetary health to think about within each quadrant what you might be able to do different, what you might be able to start doing differently today. And these don't have to be any big um, steps. They could be really tiny micro level steps. And in fact, always the everyday practices and shifts in being are what really contribute to sustainable change. So thinking about these will take just 10 minutes and we'll have about um, three, four minutes at the end to hear some of your, your thinking. Okay, I see most of us have entered back into the main room. So welcome back. I think we have a few seconds as some more people join in. I hope you've had some um, interesting conversations around how to make, you know, some of these shifts happen, thinking, um, you know, towards, as Guy had mentioned, we talked about the negative, <laughs> which, um, you know, it just offers us an ability to know what, uh, you know, what we're, and we also know through COVID, what we're potentially dealing with now and in the future. So these, these cyclical loops will entail different forms. Um, and of course, with planetary health as a webinar today, we're, we're thinking a little bit more along the lines of public health um, and health-related challenges. But these can be anything. Um, I was just recently in a, in a conference where we were talking about more politically-oriented uh, potential massive changes. So they really can be anything. Uh, Guy, did you want to facilitate or co-facilitate the debrief? I was just in a meeting now where I heard some really, really good thinking around, um, especially side of, you know, unintended impacts. Did you want to draw out a couple yeah. Of ideas? Yeah, and we've only got a few minutes, so I would be delighted to do that. Uh, I was also in a great meeting where we were talking about building awareness. Uh, so in particular amongst uh, kids, which is the generation that's going to have to do something if we don't. Um, so seriously, we can't hear from everyone. Uh, we don't have enough time. There's only a couple of minutes left. But uh, using um, reactions and uh, putting up your hand, let's see a couple of hands, just a couple of comments from folks that we can, we can build on and use to, to wrap up today's webinar. So what amazing points and, uh, and insights came up in those conversations. Uh, let's see some hands. Uh, Katrina. And don't forget to take yourself off mute. Yeah, perfect. Uh, for a moment, I was unable to unmute. Um, so one of the things you said very at the very beginning of this was uh, you were talking about the implications of a hierarchical culture. Um, and I started thinking about micro and macro things. And, and you know, at a micro level, kind of leading by example. So if you're in leadership, kind of changing the way you do things um, and more focusing on equity and, you know, perhaps giving some of your power down instead of hoarding it at the top. Um, that is a fantastic question, Karina, uh, Katrina. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, and I'm going to answer with a systems thinking response. Uh, if we look at um, Donella Meadows' work, and she she's passed away now, but she, her thinking still influences how we understand this systems theory. <clears throat> she says that all systems have hierarchy. It's it's just the way systems 
organize themselves. But here's the thing to remember, and if we can remember this, then maybe, maybe it will inform your question. Um, hierarchy exists to support uh, those, um, sorry, hi hierarchy exists to support those lower on the hierarchy, not to support those higher on the hierarchy. So as long as we remember that, hierarchy is here so that I can help those supposedly lower than me, or if you want to invert the, uh, the triangle above me, um, that's how we use our hierarchy. I, and and if, if we do that, then people will see um, and be aware. And why do I see that it's 10 o'clock? <laughs> so are we stopping on one comment or do we carry on? I would suggest getting one more comment before we close. Okay, one more comment. Brave person, put up your hand. Remember the courage that I was talking about. Yes, Danielle. Hi there, uh, I'm Danielle. Um, speak up on behalf of kind of myself and our group. Um, Listen to a fantastic podcast recently by Brene Brown and Amy Cuddy on pandemic flux syndrome and how many of us are have bore, bore too much weight existential anxiety for too long uh, throughout this pandemic um me being one of them i could just have come off of a stress leave um and doing some really deep learning about letting go of stress and letting go of emotion letting go of the need to fix it all especially when i'm quite a visionary um uh kind of a person and i see a lot and so I think that's a trend that we're, a lot of us are seeing. And so I really appreciated, Wanda, your comment on mindfulness. And I'm just seeing how, just how valuable that really is, where there is just stress on all sides of us. Um, mindfulness, and then the practice of staying present in the moment, whether that's to family, whether that's to the work stress, whether that's to whatever it is, but not allowing um, everything else around us to distract from where we are in the present moment. So, yeah. I love it. What a beautiful note to uh, finish this webinar on. Thank you so much for that, Danielle. Um, back to you, Wanda. Yeah, thank you for that, Guy. Um, thank you, everyone, for your participation and thinking forward. Hold on to that thinking. <laughs> um, take it into your day where you see fit and aligned. Uh, and I just want to thank you for joining us today. And I look forward to seeing you in the next webinars, if possible. And I'll now hand it back to Catherine. Well, thank you so much, Guy and Wanda. I'd like to invite everyone to uh, join me in offering a round of applause. Uh, you can do that with the reactions tab uh, or just uh, send a little bit of uh, love in the chat room. Yes, thank you. Lovely to see the icons coming up. Well, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, some thought provoking ideas and some uh, much needed suggestions for these uh, challenging times. Uh, I'd like to mention for those of you on the line who would like to continue the conversation or come at it from a slightly different perspective, we have three more webinars coming up. The first is uh, Thursday, November 25th. Uh, you can see on your screen here, this is Sport for Development and Peace. And I'll just say that we have a, a special guest, Suhail Tandon. Uh, we just, Wanda and I just met with Suhail um, about a week ago. And the work that he is doing in India to promote gender equality, empowerment, holistic leadership development with young girls and boys in India is just phenomenal. So I'm really, really looking forward to that webinar. And of course, um, the next one after that happening in January, food security, a topic very close to my heart. So food security, specifically from an Indigenous global perspective. So that one's coming up January 18th. And then internationalization of higher education. This one's coming up February 15th. And let me tell you, this idea of internationalization has been around for gosh, over a decade now, close to two decades perhaps, but what does it really mean? How can we really deconstruct this idea of internationalization in higher education from a global leadership perspective? So please join us. These are going to be three wonderful thought-provoking webinars. I hope you can return, share it with your friends. And uh, again, I'd just like to thank Wanda and Guy for their words and uh, Karina and Selena and Andrea and Lisa and many, many, many others behind the scenes who have been helping us today. If you would like to have more information about the Masters of Arts in Global Leadership 
or some of the shorter programs. There's a graduate certificate, a graduate diploma. We have an on-campus option now. We have uh, blended learning options. We have accelerated options. There's a whole suite of global leadership programs, as I mentioned at the outset. So here on the screen now, you'll see uh, the information to get in touch with our enrollment advisors, learn.more at royalroads.ca, or if you're joining us from outside of Canada, and I hope many of you are, the International Admissions Office, learn.more.international at royalroads.ca. And of course, you're welcome to contact us directly in the School of Leadership Studies, leadership.admin at royalroads.ca. And with that, my friends, we'll draw this webinar to a close. It's been lovely spending this morning with you or afternoon, evening, depending where you are. We look forward to connecting with you another time. Take care, everyone. Stay safe out there.